Hello, everybody. Welcome to another thing in which I sit with somebody else and we talk about stuff together. So we both don't have to write about it in any way that takes time. But hey, we're here to talk about something that we both enjoyed for once. And I, I'm of course talking about Loki, the the good show by Disney Plus. And I'm joined today with Classic Jack again because he likes the, those comic book movies. Yeah. Matt and I, we have to talk about every Disney Plus Marvel show now. But we haven't talked about the Simpsons Loki crossover event. No! Oh, I didn't watch. That looked cringe. Uh, I just wanted an excuse to include the footage of that show so people could be cringed of what I saw. I'm Loki. Let's talk about Loki instead. What's your first thing you want to say? This one's the first one that I loved from start to finish. That I really enjoyed Loki. I thought it had it had a certain charm that the other MCU uh, Disney Plus shows don't really have. More so than any of the others, it felt like it had its own identity separate from the greater MCU as a whole. I enjoyed the tone of it. I enjoyed the... It was really well paced, too. We'll, we'll talk about pacing soon, but the thing I enjoyed about how the tone of the show worked, it seemed like the most recent thing by the MCU that understood how to take that very strict formula and pretending that it's following it. It's trying to pretend it's an MCU thing while very much being something completely on its own that can just be a show that continues and never go back to the MCU. And I don't think many people would care. It would just have its own conflicts and that's fine. Yeah, it just completely exists outside of everything. They can just go to alternate universes. They can go to alternate timelines. It's fine. No one will ever know that Loki is out there doing any of this. It's the perfect way to just completely separate yourself while being tangentially related. And I thought that was just so good. And talking about like tone and vibe. This show's soundtrack, it's the most new, fresh thing we've gotten from the MCU in, I think, ages. I'm so tired of that goddamn Avengers theme, and I was so happy when I was listening to the instruments being used for synth and weird Norse music. Finally, something that sounds different than the rest. I was really worried that Loki was going to pull a WandaVision because, like I said in our video, I really liked WandaVision at the start because I thought it was doing something different than most MCU. And then I guess Disney came in and was like, you're being too different. Be the same. And I was worried that was going to happen with Loki too, but it didn't. It maintained that real that, that tone for the whole thing. Like it, it felt like it had the least studio interference of any of these shows because, like you said, it's separated from the rest. Of, except for like one aspect that I'm pretty sure is going to play heavily into the next few MCU movies. But we'll talk about that when we get to more spoilery stuff. Even the parts that will definitely play out in the MCU, that's the MCU's problem. That is not Loki's problem. And that's what I love about it. It sets out the conflict that will happen in other movies, but it pretty much doesn't even have to deal with whatever the hell that is because it has its own version of that conflict. And they played out all those ideas and content of the show incredibly well. <laughs> I will say Loki's character arc, I liked it a lot. I thought it was a good character arc, but I found I thought it was a little bit rushed mainly because he like he's supposed to be Avengers era Loki. And Avengers era Loki was just a straight up super villain. It took him a while to become the more soft, good-natured Loki that we see in this show. In episode one, they kind of like just show him all the character development he got in the prime timeline, and that kind of caught him up to Ragnarok era Loki in the few minutes. That was clever, though, because basically he's like, nah, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna be a villain forever. Oh, wait, all this power that I was trying to attain means nothing given the scope of this ridiculous conflict that they were setting up. So, uh, I guess I better just look inside and maybe I can figure out what I really want to do because literally nothing I do matters so I might as well self-reflect. 
My first reaction when I saw this scene was I didn't like it, but the more I think about it, the more I enjoy it. But uh, when he, like, grabs the Infinity Stone, he's like, ha-ha, I win. Like, he thinks he's beaten the TVA. But then he realizes that they just have, like, a million Infinity Stones in here, and they're worthless. Like, his grand plan revolved around that. And then he finds out that he's in a place where it means and it's meaningless. Is this the greatest power in the universe? Oh, uh, talking about episode one, two, and stuff like that, I'll give the show props for introducing a little side character that I enjoyed. And then they're like, yeah, this character is not important for the rest of the plot or conflict, so we won't bring him back. They were done with him after episode three, so they didn't have to keep including things that were unnecessary for the plot or for the pace. And that's why the pacing of the show is leaps beyond better than any other thing they've done in Disney Plus. All of the fat has been cut and it's just straight plot and character stuff and no point do we stop trying to deal with some part of the conflict. I was really worried like in that first episode that that guy was gonna be a main character is like oh god he's gonna be our Cat Dennings he's gonna be our funny side character who has to interrupt the story every like five seconds to tell an MCU joke. I can't believe Wanda and Vision are having a baby. You want me? Heck, I thought about it for sure. Oh, you took a chip? Sure. But uh, no, he never shows up again. We never see him again. Well, he's probably died. I don't know. He's such a like minuscule person in that entire thing. He's probably just doing his job somewhere else away from all of this nonsense that he does not want to deal with. No, he died. I think it makes sense that this show is so well paced because it's essentially like six characters plus Loki variants and that's it. That's the entire global cosmic conflict and it still feels like it has a large scope. And I think I guess that they were able to save money in casting because they spent it all in sets and props and costumes and the VFX that looks better than some of the actual movies that they have made recently, which kind of shocked me. I guess visual style really pushes your show to look better. Maybe there's one scene that looked slightly weird in the TVA that the green screen wasn't all there, but the rest is impeccable for me. I was astonished by how good it looked. Again, considering that uh, Disney probably didn't like care about this one as much as the other shows. You're only saying this because he wasn't aggressively hidden by random things that they're gonna set up. This is the setup, but it doesn't matter because it sets up itself up anyways. So it works within the plot. Can I give a can I give a little nitpick? Go ahead. Technically. In the comics, the Time Variance Authority watches over the multiverse. This should be this should be the same the exact same TVA from the comics. Jack, the comics they don't exist. The prime timeline is the movie timeline. It's fine. Yeah, Marvel doesn't care about the comics. They <laughs> Hey, 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 you get you get some comic stuff in this one. Don't be a baby. They give they give you a little few treats. They give you comic accurate 70s, 60s style costumes and you you should be happy. I was I was happy that uh, when Richard E. Grant Loki shows up and he's wearing a completely comic accurate costume, they never once say, you look ridiculous. Who in their right mind would ever dress like that they they finally did it they dropped the joke from 20 years ago <laughs> took them a little bit but they figured it out they just let him wear the costume i i guess i can see it being a joke because like it does look a little silly but they never address that it looks silly yeah no he's also made look cool as hell because old loki rules I was gonna say, uh, he's Richard E. Grant, and, uh, that brings- that's our first Doctor Who connection. Because Richard E. Grant has been in Doctor Who three separate I'm times. not including any of this. Twice as the Doctor. <laughs> I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, first it was in Scream of the Shell so played the ninth one. He's played both the ninth and, and that, the tenth. That Doctor is in canon, even Richard though the Paul McGann TV movie the Doctor is considered canon. And then, and then there was a comic comic relief special. 
I hate everything about this. I hate the, the last five minutes of my life. They were all wasted. Nice tits. We can talk a little bit about the supporting cast. Uh, I didn't know Owen Wilson could be this charismatic. Wow. And Sylvie and the other grunt lady, the boss lady, all of the supporting cast was incredible. And Tom Hiddleston just keeps showing that he knows exactly what he's doing with the Loki character because he just seamlessly goes from super villain to super charismatic, caring man that just wants to help basically himself not be himself which is bizarre to say but that's kind of the point of the show yeah aside from loki mobius is my favorite character because owen wilson just has such a presence you know like he's just being completely laid back but also being in full control of the room even when he's like not in control and he's a little bit upset and is losing he still has a, a great presence and feels like he could get the upper hand back in a second if he wanted to Something we can also thank the show is for minimizing the effect or the importance of the hand-to-hand -hand fight scenes. They are still present because it's still a Marvel thing, so they have to have hand-to-hand -hand fight scenes, but they minimize it enough and the show is focused enough on the main plot and character development and just character interactions that it's just there for a little bit of flavor and not really the focus because it's a good thing is not the focus because they still can't figure it out but it doesn't matter because it's not the focus so it's fine i can let it go the ending fight scene wasn't a stupid hand-to-hand -hand fight where they just throw lasers at each other they still threw lasers at each other a little bit but it wasn't the focus of the main conflict at the end i was so so happy about that and also the main fight at the end wasn't about each person wanting to kill the other. It's about Loki trying to keep a Sylvie from killing the spoiler. Yeah, they tried to kill the spoiler man. Big spoiler man. Let's just say the spoiler man lived up for five episodes of build up. Essentially, he completely delivered in being as threatening and scary of a concept that the show was setting him up to be. And spoiler man managed to just be charismatic as all hell as somebody that was somehow down to earth, even though he essentially is so omnipresent. If we're gonna already be talking about what, how much we like him, we might as well just say his name. Fair enough. All right, everybody, spoil time, spoil time. It was Kang. Not what you were expecting, hmm? Talking about how Owen Wilson has such a presence and he's like so in total control, even though he's very laid back. I give that to Amortis. I'm too technical. I'm going to have to call him Amortis. My brain can't call him Kang because I know he's not Kang. Yeah, Immortus, he had such a good presence. And I'm really excited to see uh, when we start seeing like variants of him popping up. Because I think they said it's going to be Kang as the villain of Ant-Man and the Wasp. 3. This has given me a reason to be excited for Ant-Man and the Wasp 3 just to see this guy again. He just stole the scene. It was incredible. I was like, how? How did you do that? You were in the show for pretty much 30 minutes and I'm like, I, I need season 2 now because I need you to be here for longer so I can keep watching you devour the scene with your charisma. I thought that was interesting that they said this show is going to get a season two because uh, it's the first one that I, I, when I saw the ending, I was like, that's where it ends. I loved it. I love how they're just like, nah, here, the end is going to be pretty much the worst possible scenario, which serves both as a good ending for like a loop scenario or as a good hook for a branching of the story, if you will. I was, I was very interested because I was kind of thinking maybe Kang was going to be the villain at the end, but I was like, okay, everyone thought Mephisto was going to be the villain of WandaVision. That didn't end up happening. People thought Red Skull was going to be the villain of Falcon and Winter Soldier. That didn't happen. So I was like, it's not going to be Kang. Kang is the one everyone's expecting. He's the one everyone thinks. It's not going to be Kang. So when Kang pops up, I was like, oh, it's Kang. I, I was nervous at first because I was like, oh, it's Kang. Are they just using this to set up future MCU movies? And I was like, oh, but immediately his performance performance was so good that I was completely on board with Kang. He completely made the show land for me because Loki was very much about all to do with mystery, all to do with what it is to be so uncertain of what it is your own will that the Lokis themselves and everybody in the TVA pretty much has to have a self-reflection moment and decide what type of person they want to be and what they want to do with that uncertainty. And when they get the answer, the answer wasn't unsatisfying because his performance was that good.
good. He gave good enough reasoning of what he was doing. Sure, it was selfish and self-centered. It was just because he wanted that his timeline was to be the one to exist. And then I guess he just stopped caring. I'm older than I look. This game is for the young, the hungry. That's such an interesting angle. He got so tired. He was like, I'll just let these Lokis run things if they want. I don't care anymore. If they don't take it, I'll just come back anyways. I'm like, that's wonderful. That's a great setup for a bigger conflict to come. And it makes sense. I really enjoy the exploration of the, that idea of whatever can happen will happen. But then this person is just like, yeah, but I don't want that to happen because this is my timeline. So this is the timeline that I'm keeping. And then it made that secret, sacred timeline that the TVA kept preaching make a lot more sense. And now people can stop bitching about, oh, but now it really demeans what the Avengers did because some lizard people decided for them. It's like, nah, that stuff happened. And then this guy just decided, I'm just going to keep that going and going forever because it's the version in which I exist. He says there was a multiverse where like every possibility happens, but I just want mine to happen. It would have been so easy to just be like, well, this is the thing that's supposed to happen, so I'm not gonna let anything else happen, but like, no. No. I was talking to Twouse. He was annoyed by one aspect that when someone gets pruned, they don't die. They, they just get sent to uh, the end of the universe. I didn't mind it. I thought that idea made sense because the TV was full of shit. Where's your manners? I also like that they kept pu putting stuff from the Bermuda Triangle showing up there consistently. <laughs> I thought that was great. I, I, when I realized what they were doing in that scene, I thought like, oh, that's cute. Yeah, the humor in the show is just more like kooky and weird. The Loki being D.B. Cooper, that's great. The interrogation things of where they just put him in the loop of a place that, and time that is mostly inconvenient. Where he just gets kicked in the balls over and over. Yeah, that, that joke is like childish, but the fact that he just starts having proper developments and trying to be better just to get rid of this annoyance. I'm like, that's great. They use the joke for the plot. It's, it's just such a cleverly put together show. It got a lot of heart. It could have just so easily been like Disney says, make a Loki show. It's like, what am I supposed to do with a Loki show? And they, they just phone it in. Like a <clears throat> Black Widow. These are clearly big fans of sci-fi. They knew what they wanted it to be and they didn't let anyone uh, tell them what their show should be. Oh yeah, they, they definitely are big fans of sci-fi because the opening music at points do sound like the Doctor Who opening and I'm like, oh yeah, you guys know exactly what you're doing. You're making a Doctor Who substitute. Because Doctor Who is stinky. <laughs> it's a stinky show right now. It's a stinky oh uh oh, it's not good right now. So, hey, uh, you guys are looking for time travel shenanigans to show? Here you go. But also with multiverse and more money so why not we don't know what season two is going to be like but season one is a must watch if you're tired of mcu and just want to watch something different just listen to the soundtrack you will understand going to the outside world what do you think of people who are upset that loki has a love interest with himself it makes so much sense for Loki to fall in love with himself. He's an incredibly narcissistic man or woman who just loves himself above all and wants things for himself all the time. So when he finds a female version of himself, he's like, nice. I made the correct decision and I think uh, I'll be doing this from now on of uh, not looking at Twitter at all about anything to do with Loki because I, I was like, this show is too good to be ruined by Twitter. If the show is boring, annoying and filled with things that I find that could be cut out, I won't care to not look at Twitter. This show was good enough that I'm like, okay, I'll make a point to avoid the insane at people so it doesn't leave a bad taste in my mouth. And that's how good the show is. That it made me want to not look at anything. And I love looking at dumb shit. It's too good, too good to let Twitter ruin. It's a very well-made show. It is clearly has a lot of heart into it. It feels very different than everything that's been in the MCU. From people I've talked to who've watched it, there are, it, I've got mixed reviews. There, are, I mean, there are some people who I've talked to who just think it's too weird. And you know what? The fact that the MCU can make something that some people think is too weird and they don't get, the MCU is usually trying to appeal to the widest audience possible. And the fact that they didn't do it this time 
That's wonderful to me. Maybe that, does that sound gatekeepy? I don't. I don't mean it to sound gatekeepy, but no, it, it's perfectly fine. They made a show that was just the thing that they wanted to make. They didn't worry about being too weird at any point. They had a vision, and that's respectable. And、uh, yeah, I recommend Loki. <laughs> All right, bye bye, goodbye, people, bye. bye.